Here we are. Okay, part four. This is the last one. It all comes down to this. We've been talking about prayer for the last three weeks. This is our fourth week. And we've been talking about prayer. We've already tackled what prayer is. Okay, we talk about we talked about how we pray, when we pray, and today we're gonna just quickly tackle why pray. Okay, why we should pray. Since that, that word why is really important. Okay, we usually ask this word why whenever um we're wondering if it's gonna be worth our time, if something we're gonna be something we're gonna be doing is worth our time. We especially ask this question why whenever we're commanded to do something that's difficult or something that we don't like. Now, prayer is something that a lot of people do not like doing. It's something that's actually deemed to be difficult. Okay, you actually see um, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 15, verse 30 say, listen, um, or, or strive together with me in prayer or work with me or labor with me in prayer. That, that's connotation that prayer itself is difficult. So why should we pray? Okay, why should we pray, friends? This is one of those talks where I feel humbled because I could go on about this. We could go on about this for like a hundred points for two hours. But for the sake of simplicity, because I struggle with prayer, and I know some of you struggle with prayer, for the sake of simplicity, I have three quick reasons why we should pray. Three reasons why we should pray. Number one, we pray because we have to. We pray because we have to. John chapter eight, verses 31 through 32, um, there's a snippet of this. It's one of the most famous words of the entire Bible. It's on, it's on tattoos, it's on bumper stickers. A lot of people know by memory. It's quoted by a bunch of movies. But the first part of, his, of Jesus' statement here is actually really, really important. So Jesus is addressing a large multitude of people and he actually says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word... You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, everyone knows that second part, okay? The truth will set you free. That's, in, that's been quoted in a bunch of movies. That's on a bunch of people's tattoos. People use that every day in a daily conversation who have nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the Bible, but the truth will set you free. Listen, that first part is extremely important. The first part is extremely, extremely important. It's vital, okay? If you consider yourself a Christian, you should absolutely know this. And it's whenever Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So what Jesus is saying here is, hey, the mark of a true disciple of Jesus is abiding in his word. The mark of a true disciple of Jesus is someone who abides in his word. That word abide is not used anymore. That's not a famous word, that's not a popular word. I'm sure you probably haven't used it today. I haven't used it today except right now and when I was studying for this, <laughs> abide. That word abide is the Greek word meno and it literally means to remain in, to stay within or to not depart. So Jesus said, hey, the mark of a true disciple is those who, who do not depart from my word, who stay within, stay inside of my word. And he's talking about obedience. Okay, he is talking about obedience. So the mark, one of the marks of a true disciple of Jesus Christ is not just someone who says, I'm a Christian. It's not someone who says, I've been in church since I was two. It's not just someone who was baptized when they were five or he said, no, the mark of a true disciple is someone who obeys me. It's obedience. Okay, obedience is the mark of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And a part of that obedience is obeying Jesus' call to pray. He's making the call to pray constantly throughout the scriptures. He calls us to pray. Okay, we're called to obey that. Here is a quote that I love from John Piper. It says this, um, we pray because dozens of times in the Bible, we're told to pray and God loves us. He wouldn't tell us to do something that is bad for us. It is good for us. I love the simplicity of that quote. That's a profound guy, but I love the simplicity of that quote. So the number one reason we should pray is, well, God said so. Okay, and God is for us. 
This Bible, this Bible is not speculation from man, but this is revelation from God. So when God commands us to do something, argument over, argument over. So what's, why should we pray? We pray because we have to. Okay, we pray because we have to. Number two, why should we pray? Not only do we pray because we have to, but we pray because we get to. Okay, you and I are to pray because we get to. Now, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17 actually says this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. I'm going to stop there. Okay, there's, there's a lot there, man. Romans 8 is one of those chapters in the Bible that is just too pregnant for its own good. There's just so much there. It's such a rich passage that it literally I could go line by line through Romans 8 and it would take me the entire semester to do so. As a matter of fact, there's actually a pastor that I love watching from Dallas. He's actually going through a little snippet of the book of Romans chapter 8, just Romans chapter 8, and it's taking him like five or six weeks. I mean, this is just a very, very rich passage, but let me give you a snippet of its goodness just right now. Look at that verse 14 again. Okay, look at verse 14 one more time. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, here's where it gets fascinating and interesting. Okay, um, we're described as sons. Okay, as followers of Christ, we're described as sons of God. Now, the Greek word that Paul uses for the word sons is actually a legal term, a legal term that's used in inheritance laws and adoption laws in first century Rome. So, the book of Romans is a letter to people who are living in Rome, and they have adoption laws and inheritance laws. And this word that he's using, the word son that he's using, is a legal term that's used within those laws. And back then, in first century Rome, they had these laws, adoption laws, that said, okay, if you are adopted by a family, okay, if you are a child who was adopted by a family, okay, it doesn't matter how awkward it is. It might be awkward when you walk in because you have new siblings in a new house, a new way of life, new parents, new food. It might be awkward for you. It might even be awkward for your parents because they have a new kid, Okay, and, yet, and, and they're trying to like manage anger between the jealousy of, of the siblings. It might be weird for the family, it might be weird for you, but listen, if you are adopted by a family, you have the same legal rights as someone who was born of that family. Okay, if you are adopted by a family, you have the same legal rights as someone who is born into that family. Now, we know that the crux of the gospel is that the Son of God became a, 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 the Son of God became a creature, so creatures be, can become sons and daughters of God. And uh, in that same way, Paul is saying is that, that 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 adoption, that that cosmic adoption, the fact that we're adopted into God's family, John chapter one verse twelve, for those who believed in Him got the right to be born of God. That divine adoption is the same as the Roman one. Okay, meaning. As you are adopted into God's family, you are fully a son slash daughter of God. You can enjoy all of the privileges, all of the obligations, and all the inheritance as God's children. It might be awkward. You might have to adapt to this adoption. But when you are adopted, you are adopted. Can you enjoy all of the rights and privileges as someone who is really God's children? Not kinda. You're not kind of God's kid. You are fully God's kid. No matter how much you're struggling and stumbling forward, you are God's kid. And with that in mind, he keeps going. Look at verses 15 through 17. It says, You have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Then heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Friends, what he's saying here is that the Holy Spirit, okay, the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ for him to be your Lord and Savior, God downloads himself into you. God the Spirit downloads himself into you. And that Holy Spirit doesn't nag you, but he keeps constantly encouraging you. Hey, use, use your access to God. Hey, you're a son, not a slave. You're a son of God. You are a son of God. Exercise your sonship. Exercise your sonship. Exercise your sonship. Friends, you have access to God. You have access to God. Why not use it? So we get to. Okay, we get to. In prayer, okay, we get to be healed. In prayer, there is healing available. Healing available. Who needs healing? I need healing. Do you need healing? There is healing available. And you see this in, in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, God creates this world to work in perfect shalom. And then Adam and Eve rebel against this good, creative God. And God, if God was fair, he would have just opened up a trap door. They would have fell inside. He would have covered it back up. He would have started over. Or he would have annihilated earth. He would have done something. But instead, instead of just going forth with his wrath... God goes into healer mode. Okay, he goes into healing mode. And he walks back into the garden and starts asking questions. That's fascinating. He starts asking questions. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I command you not to eat? He goes back in there asking questions. Now, God is omniscient. Okay, he sees everything. He knows everything. So when he walks back into the garden and he's asking questions, friends, he's not collecting information for his investigation. He's not doing a CSI report to see what went wrong and try to gather the facts. That's not what he's doing. The reason he's asking questions is because of this. You telling God what he already knows starts to heal you. You telling God what he already knows actually heals you. This is a question that comes up a lot with junior hires and high schoolers. Why, why should I pray if God already knows everything? Well, I believe in Genesis 3, it shows us, okay, it shows us that you, us telling God what He already knows starts to actually heal us. So we pray because there's healing available. We get to. We get to pray and we pray because there's healing available. Furthermore, in prayer, there are blessings available. Okay, blessings available. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. You guys have heard me say this passage a million times, but I love this passage. We should never get sick of this passage. It says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in, who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? What he's saying there is this, man. Like, as evil people, we enjoy giving good gifts. Okay, especially fathers. Like, I, I'm an uncle now. I enjoy giving a good gift, even if it's just a snack to my nephew or um, a toy or even just some of my time and attention to my nephew. I enjoy giving him that. And I'm a broken man. I'm an evil man. I'm a sinful man. God is perfect. Okay, God is, is perfect. And he says, that you who are evil, you know how to give good gifts. How much more? How much more do I know how to give good gifts? Friends, we get to pray because God enjoys giving good gifts to his children. I really believe you see this all over the Bible. Like God gets a thrill out of giving good gifts. He gives good gifts to his children. I don't know about you, but reading that passage right there, I, I would rather have my prayers go unanswered than unasked. Like, I would really rather have God going, hey, Leo, you asked for that? The answer is no. I would rather that than me just to hold in my prayers. I would rather have my prayers go unanswered than go unasked. Bottom line, 
is this. We get to pray. We get to exercise our sonship. We get to exercise our adoption. We get to pray. And right now, if you're a believer, know this, that the Holy Spirit's inside of you and he's not nagging you. He's encouraging, hey, hey, use, you have Jesus' ID badge. Use your ID badge to get to the Father. Okay, talk to the Father. We, we get to pray. So number one, why do we pray? We pray because we have to. Number two, we pray because we get to. And lastly, number three, we pray because it's good practice. We pray because it's really, really good practice. I love how the Bible ends. And I ask you guys this question all the time. What's the end goal for the Christian? What's the championship prize of the Christian? Is it praise from the world? Is it a pat on the back for how much we never cussed? Is it a pat on the back for how different we were? What's the grand prize for the Christian? And it's found right here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. It says this. This is John. It gets a glimpse of, of heaven and heaven in the future. The New Jerusalem, and he says this. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Friends, the Bible ends with you spending forever with God. That's why I'm in it for that's the, God, that's the fulfillment of the gospel is Leo gets God. <laughs> and you get God and we get God forever. That's why I'm in it for. Jeremiah 31, he prophesies of a time when there's going to be a day we're not going to need any more prophets. There's going to be, look at me, there's going to be a day we're not even going to need any more pastors. <laughs> there's going to be a day we're not going to need any more sermons. Okay, because 30, Jeremiah 31 says that the, the law of the Lord be written on our hearts. It's going to be written inside of us, okay? We're going to have full access with him. That's what the Bible is about, is the word Emmanuel, God with us. The okay, dwelling place of God is with man and man with God. God with us. And friends, we pray because we can practice that now. While we wait, prayer is the lifeblood of our relationship with God. We get to practice for the real thing by talking to him now. Okay, I believe that God giving us his word is a miracle in and of itself. I will go to the grave saying that he, he intervened through history to give us his word. And we can know about God. God is a knowable God. And now we can even talk to him. We can practice the real thing by talking to him now. So we pray because it's good practice now. So there you have it. Okay, we talked about what prayer is. How do we pray? When do we pray? And why we pray? Now, now, obviously, there's a lot more that could be said and probably should be said. There's a lot more that will be said later. I don't believe in just hoarding everything I know about prayer into these four weeks. I'm going to drip it into everything we talk about because I do believe that prayer should be the lifeblood of our relationship with God. But I think this is a good stopping point. I'm going to end by giving you this passage that I gave you last week. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without stopping. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. So until next time, stay connected. Love you. Bye.